Hello student, today we are going to know about English literature before Chaucer that is 500 to 13 the place of old English literature in our study. Among historian of our language, it was formerly the practice to draw a sharp dividing line between what they called Anglo-Saxon and that new speech which they distinguished as English, which after the conquest gradually arose from the union of this Anglo-Saxon with the normal French brought over by the conqueror. This dividing line is not recognized by modern writers who insist that in its foundations English is essential a Teutonic language that the English of the 14th century grew out of the Anglo-Saxon of the 5th by a regular course of evolution and that nothing occurred at any stage to break its continuity. For this reason the term Anglo-Saxon is now commonly dropped and all English used instead. A corresponding change has naturally taken place in the interpretation of the history of English literature. Here again the idea of unbroken continuity is emphasized and as what was Anglo-Saxon is regarded as an early form of English speech. So what was once called Anglo-Saxon literature is regarded as an early form of English literature. According to this conception, English literature did not begin as used to be said with Chaucer. It began far back with the beginning of the history of uh, the English people on the continent of Europe before bands of them had settled in the little Iceland which was presently to become the home of their race. I am not now going to question the modern scientific view, yet we may still recognize the practical con convenience if not the scientific accuracy of the older view which it has displayed. It is true that we can trace the gradual growth of Chaucer's language by a process of slow and broken development out of that which Cadmon had used some even centuries earlier. But there is still one fund fundamental difference between Chaucer's English and Cadmon's. We have to learn Cadmon's Old English as we learn a foreign language while the Chaucer's Middle English is full of words and items which, which puzzle us. We rightly feel that it is only an archaic form of same tongue that we use today. So with literary style that of Cadmon is based on principles radically different from ours. That, are, that of Chaucer on principles which are substantial those of our own poetry. Continuous then thought continuous then though the history of English literature is formed the 5th century to the 20th we may still hold that literature before Chaucer constitutes a special field of study and that is only with Chaucer that modern English literature definitely begins. Adopting this view here we will merely sketch with the utmost brevity the growth of our literature period to the middle of the 14th century and take this period as the real starting point of our narrative. Literature before conquest a considerable body of Anglo-Saxon poetry has been preserved in including one piece of immense interest, the epic Beowulf. Of the authorship of this nothing is known and its history is still a matter of controversy. But it is probably that it grew up in the form of ballads among the ancestors of the English in Denmark and South Sweden. That in this form it was brought by invaders to this country and that it was here fashioned into an epic perhaps by some Northumbrian poet about the 8th century. Manifestly hidden in origin it is as it stands the work of a Christian writer. It tells with rude vigor of the mighty fears of the hero whose name it bears. How first he fought and killed the monster Grendel who for twelve years had wasted the land of the king of the dance. How next he slew Grendel's mother and how at last a very old man he went out to destroy a fairy dragon receiving as well as giving a mortal wound. Vivid pictures of life in war and peace among our remote forefathers add greatly to the value of a fine old poem. Apart from Beowulf, the most important surviving example of our oldest English poetry are to be found in the work of Cadmon and Sin Ulf. 
both of whom belong to the north and to the period immediately following the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity which began at the end of 6th century. Cadman, who died about 680, was a servant attached to the monastery of Whitby in Yorkshire. According to a pretty tale told by the Venerable Bed, the power of verse came to him suddenly as a di divine gift. He had never been able to sing to sharp as others did in festive gathering in the monas monastery hall and when he his turn came round he had always been used to re retire in humiliation. But one night having gone to the stables to look after the horses of which he had charge, he fell asleep and an angel appeared to him in a vision and told him to sing. Then when he asked, What shall I sing? The heavenly visitor replied, Sing the beginning of created things. And waking, waking he found himself to his atos and astonishment, adored with the faculty of poetry. Three free phrases of scripture which have come down to us in a manuscript of the 10th century had been attributed to him, one dealing with the creation and the fall, the second with the exodus from Egypt, the third with the history of Daniel. But it is now believed that a considerable portion of this poem is not the whole of them, is the work of Cadmum himself, but of his imitators. They were first printed about 1650 by an acquaintance of Milton, and it has been thought, uh, though there is no proof of this, that the great poet may have taken hint from the Genesis in writing Paradise Lost. A miraculous element also enters into the story of Sinolf career. Born, it is conjectured between 720 and 730. He was a earlier life, as he himself tells us in his dream of Rod, a wandering gilly man and a lovers of lover of pleasure. But converted by a vision of cross, he dedicated himself henceforth to religious death themes. His work include a poem called Christ, treating of a incarnation of incarnation, the descent into hell, the ascension and the last judgment. Alain, an account of the finding of the true cross according to the legend by Helena, the mother of Constantine and Juliana, a tale of Christian martyrdom. martyrdom. While generally Sacred in subject and profoundly earnest in feeling, Anglo-Saxon poetry is full of love of adventure and fighting and sometimes its martial spirits burst out into irregular war poetry as in Battle of Brunanburg 937, of which Tennyson made a spirited translation. A fondness for the sea ingrained in our English character is also another striking feature of it. In form, it rests upon principle of composition radically different, as I have said, from those which govern modern English versification in place of our rhyme or in rhyme, as it more strictly called it employs beginning, rhyme or alliteration, that is, the regular of regular and emphatic repetition of same letter, while the line are quite irregular in regard to the number of un Accented syllables introduced to state the broad rule which line of an Anglo Saxon poem consisted of two divisions. The first of these contained two accent accented syllables, the second at least one, and the uh, accented syllable in each case began with the same letter. This gives us normal type of Anglo Saxon verse, as in this line from Beolf Grendel Gogan, God's Air Bear. Another illustration will be given later from the 14th century poem in which the old alliterative system was preserved. Anglo-Saxon poetry flourished most in the North prose development later in the South. In general, while interesting from the linguistic and antiquarian point of view, the prose writing which have come down to us possesses but little value or literature. Thou hardly more than our translator King Alfred hold an honorable place as the first to put the vernacular to systematic use. 
among the works rendered by him into the language which we all understand was the latin ecclesiastical history of the venerable bad beda who wrote at jero in the kingdom of northumbria but the greatest monument of old english prose is an anglo-saxon chronicle which though it already exists before alfred was under his guidance transformed into a national history and which was so continued till 1154 when it closed with the record of the death of king stephen from the conquest to chaucer from the norman conquest to the beginning of the 13th century english had a severe struggle to maintain itself as a written language and and as consequence english literature which for nearly 200 years before William's landing had shown little sign of life, now for another period of 150 years almost ceased to exist. Its revival began in the reign of John, by which time the long-standing hostility between the native population and the invader had been to a large extent outgrown, and as the famous accident of Magna Carta shows the two elements had been welded into a single people, the loss of French possessions of the English crown tended still further to confirm the growing unity of the nation. In these circumstances, English began to ex exert itself beside the rival tongue which was already losing ground and with the English literature assume a certain histori hist historical interest. It now became clear how much has been gained in the meantime by accumulation of fresh material from various sources. We see this in the case of the first noteworthy production of the revival brood completed about 1205 by the priest of Sire. This enormous poem of some 13,000 lines contains the legendary history of India, ancient Britain beginning with Annes, whose descendant Brutus was the supposed ancestor of British people ending with the Ked Walader, the last of the native kings, and included by the way among innumerable episodes the stories of Lyre and King Arthur. But the point of special importance in connection with it is that it is a paraphrase with additions of a versified chronicle. Brood de Inglater of the Anglo Norman poet Wes, which is which in its turn had been based upon the so-called history of britain 1132 by the romancing wealth analyst geoffrey of monmouth in layman's poem then three streams of influence celtic french and english run together while though in versification it follows the Anglo-Saxon principle of alliteration. French test is reflected in the occasional appearance of rhyme a little later came or mulum a series of metrical homilies in short line without either rhyme or alliteration by a Lincolnshire priest Ramd O. R. M. Orm. And a prose treatise, the Ancrane Rivale, a rule of anchoresses, Encro, Encro, prepared by some unknown writer for the guidance of three ladies entering the religious life. A charming dialogue. Poem The Owl and the Nightingale, in which the two birds discuss their respective merits in his historical interesting because it discards alliteration and adopts French in rhyme. This is the only one other piece of native 13th century literature which calls for mention the principal production of the early 14th century Robert Manning's handling scene, the prose and bite of uh, Inuit. Both translations from the French, the Cursor Mundi, a versified account of scripture history together with many legends of the saints, belong to the religious rather than to general literature. Making of the English language The period between the conquest and the Chaucer is, however, much more important from the point of view of our language than from that of our literature during these 300 years, while little was being produced in prose or was of any intrinsic value, modern English was gradually evolving out of the conflict of opposing tongues and assuming national rank as the speech of the whole people. To trace the stages of this evolution does not, of course, fall within the scope of a primer of literary history. 
it is enough for us to know that the final product of it was mixed or compound language the grammatical structure and vocabulary of which alike were the result of normal french influence acting upon the old anglo-saxon material it was this new tongue which ultimately displaced that of the conquerors normal french long continued indeed to be the only recognized official language and to some extent the language of fashion but by the beginning of 14th century it had entirely lost its hold upon english life at large and the complete triumph of english was signalized by statute of 1362 which proclaimed that henceforth all proceeding in the law court should be in that language instead of french for more than a hundred years before this numerous english translation of french romances has shown the growth of literary public among those who has who as the phrase then ran had no french we must however remember that while french was thus disappearing there was at no standard form of new tongue to take its place english was broken up into dialects there was a northern english a midland english and a southern english which differed fundamentally from one another and which were at the subdivided within themselves into numerous minor varieties in this con confusion little by little mid east midland english tended to gain ascendancy because it was the speech of capital and of two centers of learning oxford and cambridge then when Chaucer began to write, he chose this as his vehicle, and it was largely on account of his influence that what had he thought of been only one of several provincial dialects attained the dignity of the national language. We thus come round to Chaucer, the first of our really national English poet.